Well, welcome back to Philosophy Roulette. I guess today is uh, Friday, March 20th. And uh, I'm just reviewing some philosophy articles live on the air. Please join us if you are watching this on the YouTubes later. There's a schedule, you can go to the website here on but you can see below there's a link to it um had some feedback from one of the authors uh the other day that was nice they appreciated what i had to say they uh took a little issue with one of my uh complaints i had uh over appreciated some point is uh not a universal point it only had a hold sometimes and that had messed me up slightly but Hey, it wasn't that bad a mistake, so I felt pretty good. <laughs> like, uh, all things I, uh, look at are, this is the first time I've seen any of them, so, I don't know. And, I mean, it's not always within my, uh, wheelhouse. So, what do we have today? Let's, let's just reload this. New articles. Agriculture and human valleys. Every day it's too zoffy. It's too, no, too zoffy. Considering food preference in a food insecure region of Ghana. Alright. You know, there's some things that are outside my wheelhouse, and then there's some things that are really outside my wheelhouse. I'm gonna just not do that one because I don't think I have anything intelligent to say on that topic. Wilted, wilted, pathogens, chemicals, and the fragile future, future of human of the strawberry in industry. Uh, I mean, this. I mean, maybe this is like really interesting. I shouldn't be unfair to like these folks. Looks like. Oh uh, no, it does not. Well, if I don't have it, I can't do anything about it. Okay. AI and society, big tech and societal sustainability and ethical framework. AI and Society, Editorial, Hermeneutics of Scientific Practices, and the Concept of Text. Maybe. Artificial Intelligence Applied to the Production of High Added Value Dinoflagellates Toxins. Okay. Artificial Intelligence Transparency in Public Decision Making. Uh, well, that one's just like, seems somewhat regular compared to the other ones we just read. Can a robot invigilator prevent ch cheating? Alright, so let's see if any of these things are available. Download options. Not downloadable. Nope. Uh, no. Nope. You know, that is unfortunate. The gap problem made easy. Byerly recently developed a new solution to the gap problem for cosmological arguments. Uh, let's see, cosmological arguments and its analysis. So I have a rather warm up with an analysis paper this morning than a uh, not. Let's see if we can just find this person. Maybe it's on their website. I'd rather do an analysis paper on a topic I have some clue about. <laughs> I did a uh, feminist po uh, politics yesterday, and it was uh, interesting. It's because the problem is I'm just not any good at this. Um, so, well, not really any good. It's just not my background, so it's hard for me to uh, say anything smart, and I don't know how helpful I'm being. But that's why it's roulette. You just don't know what you're gonna get. Okay, so. This is called Time for the Googling. And hopefully there'll be a preprint. You know what? Can't do it. Can't find it. It's too darn hard to locate in real time. So what do we got here? Analytic philosophy. Pluralism, prudence, and political theory. Annals of pure and applied logic. Yeah, I can't read that stuff out loud, so I can't really do much with that. Uh, 
Is this in uh, Portuguese? It looks like it's written in English. The form of eternity. Well, if it's available. I mean, hopefully it's not a long paper. And the form of eternity hopefully is very short. Yeah, for some... I think the Brazilians have to post their stuff, or they might have to. Let's find out. Uh, about the laws and research. Oh, this is unfortunate. This is very unfortunate. Nope, no, okay, so, boo. All right, so, I don't trust the rest of these either, for that matter, then. Can law wither away today? Explain the material. Well, let's try this one, and we'll go down the next one. And if I can't get anything off this page, you know what's gonna happen is I'm just gonna go and go back to like something from analysis or thought from maybe a year or two ago. And usually, stuff uh, being a year or two old means there's more likelihood it's online. Which is annoying, because how is anyone supposed to stay on top of anything if you can't read anything? Granted, I mean, lots of people have access to uh, academic libraries, but not everyone and not at the moment. Okay, so. Our best interest, a defense of paternalism. Like, oh, there's a review. I was like, why, why would you fight something by somebody else? And right, so we got strictly. Let's try this one. And it looks like lots of downloads. Maybe it's available. That's why it's got downloads. And maybe that's why people actually read your stuff when you put it online. Hooray! Yeah, one of the uh, things in this world is you have to. Remove all barriers for uh, people to do the right thing. You have to make it really, really easy for people to do the right thing. So if like you want someone to read your work and like actually comment and understand a uh, topic, you have to put a lot of effort into just the design of the experience. I mean, I hope that my setup here is a. Uh, good for you guys like any viewers out there i have no idea really but i've uh, put at least some thought into it in the hopes that uh you guys will appreciate or well, at least that this will be this these, this video series will be of use to somebody and maybe we'll get some chat one day and we can discuss some philosophy okay strictly speaking by renee jurgen bollinger and alexander sandgren a type of argument occasionally made in metaethics, epistemology, and philosophy of science notes that the most ordinary uses of some expression fail to satisfy the strictest interpretation of the expression and concludes that the ordinary assertions are false. This requires there to be a presumption in favor of a strict interpretation of expressions that admit interpretations at different levels of strictness. We argue that this pres presumption is unmotivated and thus the arguments fail. Right off the bat. I mean, yeah, some things may be graded, but there are also many different senses of words. And so you, sometimes you don't, you're not necessarily saying what sense, you're not saying that you're doing it in a higher grade of a term. You're saying in a specific sense of the word, and that is the only sense that you mean it. Like, you know, it's not, but we'll have to see what these people say. Loose talk. Yeah, you just gotta be clear about what you're saying. And it's not always a matter of degree, it's sometimes a matter of quality. A wide range of expressions can be given more or less strict interpretations, for example, flat and empty. 
Sometimes we use them in loose ways. When we say the fridge is empty, we don't mean that as an absolute vacuum. Yeah, but we does empty actually mean vacuum? I mean, okay. Did anyone ever thought empty meant vacuum? Like when you say, yeah, okay. Sometimes we use these expressions intending to defer the strict usage of relevant ex to defer to the strict usage of relevant experts. When we say that an event, an, e an event is probable, we aim to invoke the concept as defined by experts on the probability theory, even if we ourselves don't know exactly what that is. So when we say an, ev an event is a pandemic, we mean pandemic in the term, in the sense of the World Health Organization or other relevant health organizations. We do not mean the sense that it gets used in the, uh, was that that video game that uh, modeled that models pandemics and is making tons of money and they had to specifically tell people do not use our video video game to uh, track the coronavirus because that's not how it works. Yeah, Plague Incorporated. I haven't played it. I meant to download it though. It's supposed to be fun. It's, uh, I think it's free at the moment, or it was free to play. When we borrow an expression from a strict sense, we may employ harmless for our purposes simplifications that make our utterances, strictly speaking, false. We often use language in this way when describing my rheumatoid pain. I might say that I have arthritis in my thigh and it will be clear enough what I mean. But I aim to mean, but I aim to mean by arthritis what my doctor means. So if she informs me that it refers only to my affliction of afflictions of the joints, no, will just my usage. Yeah, you don't say thigh, you'd say your knee, I guess. When we aim to use an expression as the experts do, but our everyday purposes aren't demanding, we often get by with uses that don't quite meet the strict standards. Call these cases of speaking strictly enough. Again, you're not wrong because sometimes the standards are different, and so you're right by different standards, you're wrong by other standards. You're, you have to have a match between the standards and the uh, content of what you're saying. But anyway, keep going. Let's see where we're going with this. In other cases, our everyday purpose purposes require not using these, not using the strict sense. Yeah, okay. Suppose on a hiking trip, I advise against drinking water from a stagnant pool. Yes, don't do that. And someone I call them Peter replies, "Well, actually, the wind is causing slight disturbances and currents in the water. It isn't quite stagnant." Well, okay. I can simply dismiss Peter's comment plausibly because my utterance involved invoked a looser standard you see right here this is interesting like what's the meaning of stagnant in this context is it that the the water is completely flat or is it that it has it's not running from a source and out so that the um the water is not it's not running water basically it's not the surface of the water that's important when you're saying something stagnant it's is it the quality of coming and going from another place that prevents the water from ever get being flat like that or flat enough as it were so it, this is not i mean i can see that you can consider this that flat like stagnant versus like like completely no wind but there might be a question of quality here because when i say stagnant it doesn't didn't mean that there's no ripples it means that it's not running from one location to another like a river Or suppose I mentioned that two friends arrived at my party at the same time and Peter interjects that according to physics, no two events are ever truly simultaneous. So, well, it depends on your perspective. They could be uh, simultaneous to you. So, strictly speaking, they did not arrive at the same time. I can, I can, I, I, again, I can acknowledge that Peter isn't wrong without having to concede that what I said was false. I invoke a looser interpretation of the expression and can, by, and can stand by what I actually said call this a case of speaking loosely okay yeah so we've got the author here is setting up a gradation of uh meanings uh so it's like you're being uh, you could, this is sort of like going to vagueness really so you're the, the, the meanings are slightly vague along a sort of uh, a continuum and i'm arguing that maybe the continuum is not the right way to view some of these things that really they've got like uh, a, a group of related concepts, but it's not a continuous, uh, they're not continuous between each other. 
you get the flavor. We'll be using strict to invoke the standards used by the relevant naturalistic respectable science, while loose involves are usually less demanding everyday standards. Differences of strictness are unlike polysemy. Okay, yes. Okay, it's polysemy being multi, uh, multi use of words. Even if we, once we fix a sense of organic, for example, there is a further question on how demanding our standards are. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that the whole thing is a question of strict and loose. Sometimes it is a question of quality, not uh, quantity uh, in one direction or the other. Okay, still. There is an apparent contrast between strictly enough and speaking loosely. When we're speaking strictly enough, the correct interpretation of the utterance, the interpretation which specifies the semantic value of the expression, is the strict one. So what we're saying is literally false. I don't know if there's a correct interpretation. This is what I was saying also before. Like you have, you've got a, this is a parallel here. What you're saying has to be is measured by the uh, standards. There's a standard in what you're saying, and there's a, what you're saying in like the standard. And if they're at the same sort of level, then you're all getting along because you understand each other. But if we, one standard is higher and the other standard is lower, well, it's, you have to. The way you're speaking is loose and strict, and then but the way it's being measured is also loose and strict, and there's a quality issue. Okay. But when we're speaking loosely, the fact that what we've said would be literally false if interpreted in the strict sense doesn't seem to threaten the truth of what we've actually said we weren't speaking strictly. Yes. So, okay. There are three salient explanations of this apparent contrast for a target expression E, always strict. The strictest interpretation of E is always the correct one. When speaking loosely, we are just unaware or ignoring the fact that we're, what we're saying is false. Yeah, you see, the strictest is always, this is a shifting um, target too, um, because we always are learning more, so you could always be more precise, and it's like you're not going to be at the forefront of research and rheumatoid arthritis of the knee. So the only strict, the, the only then, if you were doing research and like knew all the things, could you possibly be correct, and even then things change on your feet. Presumably, next, I'm being a little uh, whiny today, presumably, presumably strict, presumptively strict, excuse me. The strictest interpretation of E has a defeasible priority over looser interpretations. Okay. Not special. The strictest interpretation of E is correct. While, when the strictest interpretation of E is correct is because strictness serves our communicative purposes. The strictness itself does not even defeasibly give us a reason to think that it is the correct interpretation. Okay. Yeah. So, this is, a, this is the setup. This is the continuum between being right and just being an acceptable interpretation along the continuum of how strict you're going to uh, need to be. Always strict takes the strictness of an interpretation as a decisive reason in the favor of a strict interpretation. Presumptively strict allows the pressure that this pressure can sometimes be overwritten in favor of a looser interpretation. We argue that one should resist imposing an overarching interpretive principle that favors a strict reading either decisively or just strongly, and instead embrace not special. Okay, that's a very reasonable position to have. The strictest standard correct. The strictest standard is correct only when we are deferring to it or our purposes demand it, and our communicative purposes do not always require deference. Incidentally, the strictest interpretation isn't always the correct one, even in clear-cut cases of deference. We can defer to looser interpretations. One Gus, our, a botanist, tells his neighbor that the brownies he's bought to their picnic contain nuts. He intends to defer to the common interpretation of nut, which includes peanuts. Gus, being an expert, knows that the strictest sense of nut excludes peanuts, but intends to defer to a looser interpretation in this context. Deference doesn't always imply strictness. Again. Yeah, this is, yeah, I feel like this isn't really a thing of a, a continuum, but um, a type, because it's like, you, he's trying to communicate that there is a something poisonous in the brownies. So, we have two kinds of special kinds of kisses and three candy explanations. We say one should not, one should prefer not special. We will argue for this in section two and point out why it matters in section three. You know, I think they're right about their argument here. It's just I'm a little, uh, I think it may not be the most interesting thing, but they're right. <sighs> what we mean. They're, 
there aren't mul there are there aren't language independent facts about what the expressions of language must mean. Linguistic expressions are communicative tools, and their meaning is tied to how we use them. All right, language is the language use theory here. What we generally use to mean use them to mean, and what we generally inter interpret them as meaning. In short, use use guides meaning. Use theory of language. Use guides meaning. The meaning of a term is usually just what it would have have to be for the linguistic practices, communication, coordination, testimony to succeed as they do in the community. This is one of the metasemantic principles invoked when theorists say stronger things like like that the meaning of an expression is in a language is just what it must be for the sentences in, in which it is used to be used by competent speakers of a language to be to come mostly come out true. Use guides meaning is a principle about the semantic meaning of expressions, not merely about what utterances involving the expressions pragmatically convey. It's a very attractive principle and also a relatively weak one. Importantly, use guides meaning doesn't imply that the expressions mean whatever would make most of our utterances true. When we borrow expressions from a strict science, much of what we say in everyday context is false. Because we aim to mean the same thing as the experts, well, that is the problem. We don't always aim to mean the same thing as experts because we don't actually. If we were the experts, then we would know what we would know how to use the words properly. But we don't aim to mean the same thing as the experts. We are aiming to mean something that we think the experts mean. But that's a very different problem. <laughs> it's like yeah, I know I'm I know I'm speaking out of my ass sometimes, and I I don't care. <laughs> but like I'm, I'm not actually meaning to mean the experts. I'm meaning to hand wave. Despite having only a hazy grasp of that of what it is, yes, it is very hazy. My grasp of everything, our hazy grasp might be wildly inaccurate or inconsistent, but I, but I know that. So it's like that's okay. <laughs> Leading us to make utterances that are mostly false, because we're mistaken about what we mean by ex the expression. No, I, see, that's the thing. I know exactly what I mean by my expression. It just doesn't mean what they mean. Um, not and and since I'm a competent speaker of English or somewhat competent speaker of English that would mean that what I'm saying is working out to be mostly true so not buying like I'm maybe I'm a little too close to these people uh, and that's why I'm getting all uh, up in arms about what they're saying not knowing what we're talking about doesn't preclude our talking about it god damn right never stopped anyone before the key to this <laughs> Excuse me. The key to this, what makes us mistaken about what we mean rather than meaning something other than what the experts mean, is, semant is semantic deference. We intend to use the expression as they use it, and this intention bears a couple of hallmarks. Well, first, while our communicative purposes might not require that we speak strictly, they aren't in tension with doing so. While we have reason to coordinate our uses with that of the experts, our immediate aims don't require precision, so getting the details right is just not worth the hassle. But our aims wouldn't under be undermined by speaking strictly. See, that I disagree with. Sometimes they would be. Uh, speaking strictly can undermine what you're saying sometimes. You, we just did a uh, paper the other day where, um, by Kate Ritchie about generics, and she was arguing that you need to be able to speak in generic terms and it would undermine certain uh, practices if you were to get rid of the generics. So speaking without, like you have to be sp speaking strictly in terms of generics, but not in terms of uh, quantificational practices. And if you don't do that, you actually lose valuable uh, precision doing that way. So it's um very not clear that, like if you were to like very, pin down the exact quantities and things, you'd lose an ability to, you'd lose a, a, a method of speaking that is very efficient uh, towards certain goals. So yeah, so I could uh, marshal Kate Ritchie against this claim right here, that speaking st strictly wouldn't undermine what we're saying. Well, sometimes it might, um, depending on how we slice things. Second, we're disposed when corrected to bring our use into line. Yeah, that's true. 
This has both a backward looking aspect, retracting previous uses that we now recognize as false, and a forward looking aspect, updating our future uses to better match the strict interpretation. These whole, you know, this annoys me. You see, you've got three M dashes here, and I'm like, it's like, it's like a, I treat them like a parentheses. They should, they should be even, but yeah. These hallmarks are features of our usage that make the expression inherit the strict interpretation, and they're prominent in cases where we're speaking strictly enough. Um, this is a normative claim about when we're corrected, we should fix stuff. You know, again, this is like how things are used. It's like the peanut case. I mean, if someone went up to the botanist and said to the botanist, look, the peanuts aren't actually the nuts that you're talking about. The botanist would be like, like, do you know who you're talking with at this point? I'm not going to update my understanding. It was the context that was more important than the uh, strictness of the speech. <coughs> so this is, this is interesting though. This should be a, a think, think about exactly what the normative uh, force is here. But not all cases where the folk uses diverges from the expert are cases of deference. Sometimes our communicative purposes are best served by not using strict this sense of yeah, the peanuts. Um, I can acknowledge that Peter is right, that in the strictest sense of stagnant, the pond isn't stagnant without coming. Well, yeah, whose strictest sense? I mean, the way I defined uh, stagnant earlier was that it has to be running. Well, that means it's going from one place to another. It's like going downhill or something. If it's just wind blowing it back and forth, that doesn't count that the pond isn't stagnant without coming under rational pressure to retract my assertion that we shouldn't drink this water because it's stagnant. Nor am I under any pressure to apply stagnant only to absolutely motionless bodies of water in the future. Yeah, very strange. Our communicative purposes and the warnings against drinking from stagnant pools requires not invoke invoking the strictest sense. More generally, cases of speaking loosely yield different disagreements and retract and retract in patterns that case of strictly speak, uh, speaking strictly enough. That retract but then cases of speaking strictly enough, the former doesn't bear the hallmarks of the deference. Taken together, these features of the cases and the use guides meaning principle make always strict unattractive. Yeah, well, I think there's other reasons, but of course, I agree. How does a presumptively strict fare? Recall that it ascribes a presumptive priority to the strictest reading of reading because it's strict, but this gets the order of explanation backwards. In the case just discussed, when strict interpretation is correct, it is also not because it is strict, but because strictness accords with our communicative purposes. Strictly speaking, false. You may consider it no great loss to sacrifice always strict, it wasn't very attractive anyway, quite so. But rejecting it deals a significant blow to what we'll call strictly speaking arguments, that is, arguments that fit the following schema. Oh, so they're marshalling this uh, anti strictly speaking. Okay, so maybe that, that could be interesting. A strictly speaking argument schema. On the strictest interpretation, the expression E means blah. Most, all of, most or all of our ordinary assertions using E are false under the strictest interpretation, so most all of our ordinary assertions using E are false. Looses, loose uses of E suit our communicative purposes better than the uses consistent with the strictest interpretation. So despite three, that would be mostly being false, we should go on using E loosely. So it is obviously enthymematic. Three only follows from one and two insofar as the strict interpretation of E is correct, even in our ordinary loose conversations would follow from always strict, but even four, accepting this as the suppressed premises inconsistent with the use guide's meaning. So given the plausibility of the principle, we might prefer invoking presumptively strict. But here, advocates of strictly speaking arguments incur an explanatory burden. When, why doesn't four defeat the presumption of favor in, of the strictly strict reading of V? where it says loose readings are better, not the, we should go for the strict ones. When the folk take themselves to mean and interpret others as meaning, some looser and successfully coordinate and successfully coordinate on the basis of those assumptions, our use guide's mean principle suggests the term just doesn't mean the, 
the term just does mean that loser then. What is more, these cases don't have the hallmarks of deference. Yeah, so when you're talking about nuts, and you mean peanuts even if they aren't nuts, actually, and I have no idea if that's the case, um, then what nut means in that case is peanut. It counts at. Plausibly, the considerations one must raise to discharge this explanatory burden will need to be specific to the expression at issue. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. Because um, the use guide's meaning principle is doing a lot of work here, and maybe there's a, another way to slice use guide's meaning, so... It may not be specific to the the it may not be specific to the expression, but it may be there is some more specific uh, understanding of how use guides meaning to know which uh, sort of level of strictness you're supposed to be at. Strictly speaking, arguments arise in a variety of semantic disputes, including moral error theory, counterfactual skepticism, and global epistemic skepticism. The specific justifications available might be different in different in various cases, and though we suspect the same explanatory idleness will appear in each context for the sake of concrete discussion. We'll use Hayek, uh, Hayek MS, uh, Hayek, oh, manuscripts argument that most counterfactuals are false as a representative example of strictly speaking argument. All right, so I like these people. I may disagree with them, but I like these people. You see what they did here? This is a, this is probably done in LaTeX, and then they used the reference there and put the, uh, this is like this is just technical silliness. They put they, they didn't write out Hayek. They, this is a LaTeX reference, and then they put the apostrophe after the LaTeX citation, which I sometimes do because it saves me from uh, rewriting names and numbers over and over. But it does make these sort of funny uh, uh, when reading it uh, locutions. So arguments that are false. Uh, so now I got. Sorry, I got uh, distracted by the uh, formatting. For the sake of concrete discussion, we'll use Hayek's argument that most counterfactuals are false as a representative example of a streaking, strictly speaking argument. Briefly, Hayek argues that strictly speaking counterfactuals constru counterfactual constructions of the form A would C are, are, only, are true only if the proposition of A and not C is zero. The probability of A and not C is zero. Yeah. But for just about any counterfactual claim, there is a non-zero probability, however strange or unlikely, of A and not C. This is because science tells us, you yeah, see, this is a strictly speaking argument, so they're appealing to a strictly speaking argument to, yeah, okay, if you're going to, this is which sort of strictly speaking argument, because it is a strict, you can assume strictly speaking, but the question is, what? according to what sort of modality, science, uh, or something else. This is because science tells us the world is genuinely chancy at the most fundamental level. Well, according to science, but maybe not according to, say, a religious uh, uh, perspective. And then, if you're being strictly religious, that would be a very different sort of world you're uh, living in, and a very different sort of uh, gradation of things. is generally chancy at the most fundamental level. And I don't know if that's even what science tells us um, on some interpretations of science. So when I tell my toddler, were you to drop the glass, it would shatter, I speak falsely. But he says, I shouldn't worry about that. Truth is overblown. We have more weighty conversational purposes, which would... So your toddler says this? Or is that Hayek says? Okay, uh, it must be Hayek. I wonder if the toddler's like, maybe you've got a really smart kid. I shouldn't worry about that. Truth is overblown. We have a more weighty conversational purpose, which would be undermined by eschewing loose talk to bring our usage, usage in line with the strictest standard. Doing so would convey, would doing so would convey, would be interpreted as saying that the law-like regularities used, usually expressed by counterfactual claims, don't hold for the object, object in question. If my toddler mere if my, I told my toddler merely that the glass would very likely shatter, he could justifiably conclude that the glass the glass is unusually shatter resistant. Yeah, there's something about um, when you highlight something, it, it changes the uh, modality of uh, the stuff. So he might think that by saying it, you actually mean the opposite because otherwise, because 
if the toddler knew that glass breaks all, almost all the time, that the one that would only very likely one would might seem comparatively stronger than the others or shatter resistant. So, um, yeah, that's a different problem, but it's an interesting issue. What it means when you when you bring up a topic, even if you say something like, you often mean the opposite of what you're saying. If you bring up something that's unusually, uh, you wouldn't normally have said otherwise. It's like, don't look in the fridge, there's nothing there. Yeah. What Hayek needs in order to discharge the explanatory burden for his strictly speaking argument is de to defend the claim that there is a presumption in favor of strictness that isn't defeated by these practical conversational purposes. This must involve demonstrating that the presumption does explanatory work over and above that done by the sorts of deference facts appeal to and not special. The main reason he offers to embrace such a presumption is that it anchors the meaning of the meanings of E. It gives uses, stable interpretations, and validates important inference patterns. Yes, but there might be other ways to anchor uh, meaning. Allowing the strictness of the interpretation of A would C to shift across context risks invalidating important dualities in, for example, a modal arrow C, if and only if not a diamond arrow not C, or rendering the meaning of counterfactuals insufficiently stable to facilitate communication, disagreement, etc. The meaning needs to be anchored down somehow, and the strictest standard seems to be a reasonably well-motivated, non-arbitrary candidate. Yes, it needs to be anchored down somehow. I mean, otherwise you, you have no... Uh, you, you, people have to be able to... Well, no, people, philosophers, want to be able to nail down meaning. And so... Uh, <laughs> This is important for philosophers, and so this is part of uh, the problem here, is uh, how to nail down meaning uh, under different contexts. We agree that meaning needs to be somewhat anchored, but we needn't embrace anything stronger than not special to accomplish this. Okay. Deference allows us to anchor the meaning of E to a relatively public interpretation, which may or may not be the strictest one. This is how there is a stable interpretation of nut, even though it isn't the botanically strict one. Sangrin and Steele manuscript illustrate one way to accomplish this for counterfactuals. They suggest that the usual purpose of counterfactual claims is to indicate ob ob objective realities in the world. We reject counterfactual assertions that fail this test, successfully coordinate with those that pass it, and interpret them as asserting something like a robust connection quite like a Ketterich Paribus law in the special sciences, holding between the explicit antecedent and consequent in the domain of inquiry involved. Okay, that's fine. Crucially, the domain invo invoked need not be fundamental physics. Okay, so now we're getting out away from this. Yeah, you know, we're finally getting away from the sort of simplistic notion of, of a single strict interpretation. Crucially, domain invoke need not be fundamental physics. When making claims about geological patterns, we aren't concerned with quantum tunneling effects, since these effects tend to confound the geological regularities. The standards of fundamental physics are, in some sense, more strict. Well, this is, again, this is a very sort of uh, science-oriented uh, view, but that's okay. But they're in an important way to... They're in an... They're in an important way inappropriate when we are talking about whether a shield, whether a shield volcano would ex erupt explosively. Yeah. As this illustrates, it's possible to identify adequate, stable standards without invoking maximal strictness. Speakers can coordinate on these by deferring to the sciences, and even if we aren't usually speaking strictly, we can when our purposes require. We can when our purposes require it. So we can preserve the features of counterfactuals that concern Hayek when we're making claims about fundamental physics. They really, they do really hold in that domain, but they don't rise up to the co rise up to coerce counterfactuals about other domains. Yeah, you see, there's this background assumption that there are more strict domains. Now, how you cash out, which how you order your domains really matters here, and there's an assumption that the sciences are the sort of uh, best and, and behind this paper and as I said like if you're say you think there's order to the universe for, uh, due to some religious belief then you're not going to buy this picture uh, outright 
but I mean you then also have the same problem in your in that modality, but it's okay. I mean, like I said, yeah, like I just said, you'd still have similar problems in your modality, but if you have these different uh, questions of what is the strictest domain, then you're talking at cross purposes, and then there isn't a notion of strictness anymore. Peter is right that from the perspective of fundamental physics, no, sp physics, no spatially separated events happen simultaneously, but that doesn't mean that we can't arrive at a party at the same time. Yeah, people can walk through the door at the same time. I mean, from the perspective of the door, that would be a simultaneous arrival. Our interest in fundamental physics, I mean, that's a good question. Like, so if you have a ring, and you go through it, two things go through it at the same time, and since the ring is all the way around, it'd be sort of, uh, it'd be at the radius. All right, well, yeah, forget that. Our interests in fundamental physics don't supersede our interest in using our language to coordinate, facilitate testimony, and communicate, and these latter interests exert more immediate pressure on interpreting our expressions. Yeah, see, this is, again, discounting the other modalities. I mean, it is an assumption made here. That, I mean, I would have just liked it better if they said that, I yeah, said it outright, that this is how they view the world, but this is sort of how they're assuming the world is. Crucially, denying presumptivity, uh, presumptively strict doesn't mean that anything goes, nor w that what E means is completely up to the speaker. There are still constraints. The language, is, the language pushes back. It's not just that the norms of inquiry that are appropriate to one domain, including the standards of precision demand, aren't automatically appropriate to other domains. Yeah. One might still think that the st strict standards enjoy at least some kind of presumptive authority, ev evidenced by the fact that the strict standards are sticky, harder to shift away from in some sense. If strict, well, I don't know what that means. What do you mean by sticky? If strict standards were difficult to shake in this way, and the difficulty cannot be explained by the usefulness of being strict, that would be some evidence for presumptively strict. Yeah, it'd be some. This is what I was saying about earlier: the normative force of these things. What is that? That's a. This is a good question. But we contend that when standards resist loosening, it is because a stricter standard is useful. Useful how? Usefulness for our con conversational purposes is the engine of interpretation in these cases, not strictness per se. As, yeah, but conversational purposes, this is again appeal to context, and you have to be careful there. As evidence, recall that I can acknowledge that Peter speaks truly when he says that, strictly speaking, water is only stagnant if it has no current at all. That's not what, yeah. I mean, the wind is not a current, though. So, this is weird. While Felicitous resisting the strict, while Felicitously restricting the strict, the strict standard. Given that our interest in whether the water is stagnant is driven by whether it is safe to drink and water is unsafe, what? Well, well before it is completely devoid of current. I can cheerfully reply that, strictly speaking, you're right, but that doesn't matter. The water is stagnant, so we, the water is stagnant, so we shouldn't drink it. The felicity of this reply suggests that the usefulness of a standard rather than its strictness is doing the metasemantic work. Okay, yeah, so it's not the fact, it's the standard. The facts about usefulness can presumably account for the stickiness of stricter standards without invo invoking presumptively strict. Um, the facts about usefulness can fully account for the stickiness. I don't know about fully account. They may somewhat account for the st stickiness of stricter standards. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I mean, this is exactly what I was getting at earlier, but they're trying to say that the facts about usefulness, I'm not sure what the facts about usefulness are. Um, I mean, the, what does the word fact actually buy us, or get us in this sense? I mean, you can just say usefulness can fully account for the stick, stickiness of stricter standards without invoking presumptively strict. So I'm not sure what the... Uh, upshot of this argument is. There's definitely an interesting thing here, but I'm not actually completely, I'm not, a, I don't understand what, uh, I don't think, well, I don't understand the point that's being made uh, very well. Could the felicity of speaking loosely be explained with pragmatics? Assuredly, but why should it need be? All parties to this debate except that conventional purposes have a role in determining meaning 
And the note onus is on advocates of presumptively strict to explain why such presumption is necessary, why appealing to conversational purposes isn't sufficient to explain the semantics, semantic value of loose uses. And for a right that the usefulness is what explains the relevance of the strict standard when we're speaking strictly, then why wouldn't the usefulness of loose standards render the loose standards relevant when we're speaking loosely? Symmetry suggests that what we literally say when we're speaking loosely is true. Yeah, so this is what I was talking about at the beginning, that the standards slide along with the way we're speaking. But then you have a question of how well, how do the standards slide, and you've got a strict standard and a loose standard versus strictly speaking and loosely speaking, or a strict, con not a context, but a strict um, method of uh, evaluation. Your evaluative, uh, evaluative uh, perspective is sliding along with what you're saying, but then you're not actually explaining anything if what you're saying has to match the situation but then you haven't you'd have to give some sort of other thing and they're saying to uh, explain whether you're speaking strictly or loosely and they say usefulness but then that's right we're right back where we're at here so a parting challenge strictly speaking arguments only run when the strictest interpretation is the correct one these arguments depend on always strict or at least presumptively strict but this presumption in favor of strict interpretations is unmotivated. The case that supports taking the strict interpretation to be correct, speaking strictly enough, tend to bear the hallmarks of deference, but many of the cases to which strictly speaking arguments are applied, speaking loosely, don't. The main considerations in favor of taking strict interpretations to be correct can, hold, can be wholly accommodated by the much weaker, not special which has the added virtue of being easily compatible with the attractive use guides meaning metasemantic principle. Our communicative purposes don't always require deference, and even when they do, they don't always invoke the strictest standards. We contend the strictest standards is correct only when we're deferring to it or our purposes demand it. If this is right, then in ordinary cases where our purposes don't require the strictest interpretation, there is no compelling reason to think that the strictest interpretation is correct, so that no reason to think we're speaking. So, and so no reason to think that we're speaking falsely. So those who want to wield a strictly speaking argument must first address three pressing questions. Why must we take the strict standard to be correct in some speaking loosely despite the striking differences between them and the cases of speaking strictly enough? Why must we take the strict standard to be correct in cases of speaking loosely despite striking the striking differences between them and cases of speaking strictly enough? What cases, what explains, you know, two, what explains the implied failure of the use guide's meaning principle in these cases? Three, what do we gain by incurring these costs? Why isn't the ability to sometimes speak strictly sufficient? If cases of speaking loosely don't invo involve deference to the strictest standards and do come down to the purview of use guide's meaning principle, then the strict strictest interpretation of E isn't the appropriate one for our everyday uses. We're speaking truly, precisely because what we assert isn't what we would have asserted if we were speaking strictly. All of this is compatible with 1, 2, and 4, and, this, and of the strictly speaking argument, all that it denies is 3. So we're throwing down the gauntlet to the defenders of strictly speaking arguments. Why should we think that the folk are, despite their intentions, non-deferential attitudes, ability to coordinate meanings and communicate success in fact speaking strictly and strictly speaking speaking falsely okay so even though i had a bunch of uh, questions about this um this is like the point of the uh, the argument i completely agree with um i just wouldn't have done it this way um and assuming that the folk the target of their argument the people who do believe that um hold the things that they said in this argument they i think the argument goes probably goes through um so th it would be a problem for those who think you should be uh, strictly speaking so i think the target of this argument is the normative thing that says you should be uh speaking this way with deference to the strictly speaking uh interpretation and if that is the target against that normative claim, then this likely has a good point. Okay, so that's it. Um, if you let, give me a comment, send me a message if you want me to take a look at something. I got some feedback from one of the other authors I reviewed earlier, and.
got some feedback and a potential new paper to read on the air. Other than that, I'll probably do another one in a few minutes, but I'm going to take a short break and I'll be back soon. Bye.